great. <laughs> so I'm going to move to the to the uh, first because I think this is uh, one of the ones that I, I really think we don't do enough, which is policy. You know, when I started doing this work, I thought about, well, if we're really going to make an impact in wicked problems, uh, we need to think about it from different perspectives. So this is what I call a multi-system intervention. I'm going to talk today about the four types of multi-system interventions that we have uh, done. The first one I'm going to talk about is interventions in policy and market forces, because we need to not only increase the awareness of the service disparities, but we also need to offer data to policymakers, uh, advocates, and community groups about how do we change policies so that they better serve uh, uh, communities of color. So then I'm going to talk about interventions in the community uh, level, how we create acceptance of treatments, augment community capacity to offer treatments in the community, increase also uh, the identification and treatment in terms of prevention. And then I'm going to talk about interventions in clinical care. And this is going to be more uh, I'm going to talk about interventions in community, clinical care, and pa patient provider interaction. And this three last ones I hope to cover in the second uh, workshop, in the second uh, presentation I'm going to be giving you. But I'm going to show you the, the work we have done in all of this area. So all of this are areas that you can do. They cannot be done, one thing that I want to clarify, they cannot be done in one R01. This has been all the work that I'm going to present is really a series of R01s, but you can add them up in a way that then you can see, okay, this is how I'm going to improve uh, and reduce disparities uh, for communities of color. Yeah, Elizabeth Hale asked, what are ways that public health can ensure there is protection in these communities of color that the vaccine testing is occurring? Well, I mean, we've really, really uh, completely, um, one of the things that unfortunately we have done is uh, we have actually, if you think about it, we have defunded public health in a bad way. And one of the things that we are doing now is trying to see, you know, how we build that infrastructure back. Because many of our communities of color uh, in their public health has been defunded dramatically. So it means that you basically are going to, um, if you think about it, uh, are going to have systems that don't necessarily uh, have a lot of infrastructure to monitor what's happening. So in a certain way, um, I think to, we need to fund, refund our, our, our public health centers. But also, I think this is where the community can ask for accountability. Uh, one of the things I would recommend is for people to take more active participation at the public health level. One of the things that happened with Flint was how the community got uh, what is called academic community partnerships where they were able to identify uh, academic researchers that had a lot of information in public health and could partner with the community to actually uh, make accountable the, the mayor and make accountable the public authorities. And they were able to do that. I think right now, given the underfunding of public health, it's those academic community partnerships that might make a big difference. Not really, I would say, the um, the public health, what I'm seeing is they're so underfunded uh, that they're, they're barely keeping pace. So I, I would say go ahead with academic community uh, partnerships to try to uh, make them accountable, especially to this uh, vaccine development and distribution. That question is from Elsa, who is a medical student who works with me. Thank you, Elsa, for submitting it. Elsa, I just unmute you. Do you want to say uh, say anything else? Make a comment. Yeah, I really liked your response. Um, I think, like, I asked the question because I know we were talking about it's important to have a really representative sample of people for the vaccine. And I was recently listening to a podcast about the vaccine hesitancy that's existing in the Black community, especially just considering the mistrust of the healthcare system. So that's why I 
And I know people that are hesitant to even get the vaccine, even though they want the protection, they are worried because they see that the system is, it's, it's a faster, you know, they call it the war speed kind of um, vaccine approval process. So there, there's even more hesitancy that's being done right. And it's hard to say, oh yeah, it's safe when it, there is this kind of hesitancy around it and from just history but also with the fact that things are at this rapid pace and who knows how well the process is being done. So I think like making people aware there are protective measures in some sort of sense is important. But I definitely think you're right in terms of the community um, accountability aspect of it. I, I think that just requires so much cohesiveness and unity and like communication that it's, it's hard to even establish that to begin with. So um, I think that'll be the challenge of this time too. Yeah, but I think this is where uh, people like you uh, can make a huge difference. And this is why we're really putting a lot of effort in this academic uh, uh, community partnerships. And actually, they're like Robert Wood Johnson is very interested in funding them. The WT Grant Foundation is very interested in funding them. And I think that this is where we can actually make a, a tremendous impact in getting people like you to actually be involved in, in, in things like this so that we could be the, the people helping uh, make sure that these things happen. So I think that it's here that, that we need to make sure that uh, we have an opportunity uh, to participate and, and you know, work with, uh, with the, the community. One thing that I have to say that yesterday came up in one of the presentations we, we were discussing is how this, the uh, in academic institutions are not really um, helping people like you or people that are interested in community partnerships uh, in terms of promotion. So one of the areas we're gonna need to change is what you know the promotion criteria because a lot of the promotion is based on grants and journal articles but i think now more and more people are looking into what is needed to have an impact and sometimes it is not journal articles and sometimes it's not another grant it's actually working with community to try to make changes big changes in these disparities so our choice is right now to try to see if we can change institutions in giving people more importance and um, uh, changing the promotion criteria. So if, for example, you do a, a OPEC that changes how policymakers in your states think about the vaccine distribution, that that's gonna have an impact. Or if you're basically working to change how uh, they collect information in the school setting to try to improve behavioral health. That could be also uh, an, an area of promotion. So for example, Harvard is looking into those, those criteria to try to see if they can change it. Because people no longer want to only write papers and only write grants. They really want to have an impact. And this is where I think we could, could do it. So this was a study that was really hard to get funded. Uh, so you, just you know, some of the things are not easy to change. This is a study that was done in collaboration with community partners to try to translate. We had done a lot of epidemiologic studies and we were trying to translate what we had found in those epidemiologic studies into policy proposals that could work uh, in, in removing disparities. So what we did is we talked about the mechanisms that we think were working in disparities. We presented it to three groups, policymakers, advocates, and community groups. And then with them, we did interviews to generate how would you use these recommendations to, to make changes in policy and programs. And let me get to the next one. What we, they decided is one of the most important areas that they wanna change was in social determinants of health. That this was an area that the three of them actually share as being central to why people of color were having such problems in mental health in terms of recovery and in terms of moving forward. Next.
And um, I mean, there's been a ton of data showing how, for example, education matters so much. For example, an additional four years of education lowers diabetes by 1.3%, lowers heart disease by 2.2%, overweight by 5%, smoking by 12%. So if we were going to do a really important intervention, education would be a target. Next. Let me show you about income. You know, there's uh, been a, an, an increase in an, uh, a life expectancy of, about, of uh, male workers. But if you look about those six years, it's really only at the top of those with higher income earners. It's not really trickling down. Only for the lower income earners, the actual in increase in life expectancy has only been 1.3 years. So if you look, Again, income is a really important one. Next one. The other one is employment. We know that unemployment affects the health in many, many ways. For example, laid off workers are 54% more likely to have poor uh, or fair health. And they're 83% more likely to develop uh, a, a very uh, serious chronic related condition. So does heart disease. So if you look about it, unemployment is, is, is a terrible, uh, it's very associated to worse outcomes in health. Next. So what did we decide to do based on what the uh, this group's told us? Do what's called a simulation study. Uh, when you try to do this programs, first of all, in and you're trying to test which of the uh, social determinants you want to use for the purposes of making a change. What we found is that you actually uh, could do simulation studies with data you already have. This uh, allows you to try to figure out which is the optimal intervention that you want to try rather than testing different interventions without knowing which one's going to work the most. Let me move you to the next one so you can see. This was a study we used data from uh, the NIMH Collaborative Psychiatric Epidemiologic Surveys. We had 16,000 people in that study, and we have a big representation of people of color. And then we also use another data set from the Social Security Administration Mental Health Treatment Study that had around 1,000 people with severe mental illness. Next. What we did is we wanted to test simulations to see which of the ones, education, employment, or income, would be more likely to improve patients with mental illness. We actually published this in Health Affairs, and I'm happy to uh, share it with all of you. What we wanted to try to see is, can we improve mental and physical well-being of people with mental health disorders by addressing their social determinants? And we looked at three levels mental health with people with common conditions versus those with severe disorders. We looked at people with different race, ethnicity, Latinos, African-Americans, and Asians and whites. And then we looked at three types of interventions, simulated changes in education and employment and income. Let me show you um, how we went about it. Next, next. So we use propensity score methods um, and we modify one social factor at a time. So we mo modify what happens if we change income, what happens if we change education, and what happens if we change employment. When we modified income, we left every all the relationships of all the other variables uh, conditional on income. The same was true for education and from employment. And then we looked at the improvements in in mental health. Next. This is the participation of the groups. This is the groups with common mental uh, health disorders. So if that sample of 16,000 people, uh, 3,417 were people that had at least one mental health disorder. And then we had in the other group, all the group was actually people with severe mental illness. And you can see there the distribution by race, ethnicity. And we had a pretty big sample uh, of the different ethnic racial groups in group A, and not such a great distribution in group B. 
Let me show you the results so you see how you can use this type of methodology. For the education, what you do is you actually look at the literature and look at interventions on education supports. How much are they likely to bond people from one group to the other? So if you have no high school, what we find is around 30 percent of people with uh, supported education can move to a high school diploma and so forth. If you ha have a high school diploma, around 30 percent of people will move to the next level to some college and so forth. Let me show you the next one. This one is income, and this is very similar to when one of the presidential candidates when uh, was talking about giving people income support, especially for people that are the lower echelons in terms of income. And we simulated a cash assistance programs. How much would we get if we gave people ten thousand uh, dollars or twenty thousand dollars, and and how would it change for these people? Next. And lastly, we looked at what would it be if we gave supportive employment and the literature, there were several studies showing that around 60% of people that are giving supportive employment will move to the next level, uh, meaning employ for at least six months. Next. What we found is pretty interesting. We found with education, very, very small improvements both for group A, which are the people with common uh, health disorders, and actually for group B. No significant real change by education. And I'm going to explain this, that this is also uh, samples of adults, so we could have different things, but we didn't find that big an, uh, an impact of education. Next. We also looked at uh, what did we find with incomes of 20,000. And again, interestingly enough, we found very small improvements for people with mental health, some moderate improvements for people in physical health, whites, and then almost no significant change in mental or physical health for those with severe mental health disorders. Next. What we did find is employment made substantial improvements it did substantial improvements for both the, the white adults, the African-American adults, and the Asian adults. We found no significant difference for Latinos, which was an issue of uh, concern. Why not for Latinos? And then in group B, we found moderate improvements. Uh, the sample was too small to break it up by uh, different subgroups, but we did find moderate effects. Let me show you some more visually what we found. Next. If you look at employment, it really in the simulation, what was that it changed uh, people's reported mental health according to the SF12 for both people with severe psychotic or mood disorders. So it was really a promising program. The next one I'm going to show you is uh, next. You can see it here. For people uh, in terms of changes in number of days out of role, we found that there's uh, again an, a big improvement in employment for non-Latino whites, for African Americans, a smaller non-significant effect for Latinos, and also a significant effect for Asians. Next. So what does this mean? This is the type of thing. I wanted to say that there are limitations in the simulation. I'm going to jump this, but basically there are differences and this is cross sectional data. So you have to be careful. Uh, we did not include uh, a group of adolescents, so it could be that education is very significant, but not necessarily in adults. And then we have to be careful about the precision of this estimates. And this is all self reported information. So we would like to do it with objective data next. So what it means is that this is really an important area that we should be investing. We took this results and we actually presented in a panel of policymakers. And th there was a discussion about whether the states should start uh, funding more. Ne let me go to the next one, Jenny. Uh, whether they should start in, uh, in integrating employment as part of mental health. 
whether that would be something that should be, and care managers, for example, assisting people that have mental health problems as part of retraining and training in terms of uh, someone like IPS, which is an individual, individualized uh, program for helping people get jobs. So this is an example of how you could do an intervention in policy. Next. So we, we, this is where you can bring this data, bring it to a policymaker group and try to see if they would be willing to take it up. And it's the type of discussion of getting people immersed in the data, seeing the results of the data and then discussing them that you can move it to the next level. Next. This is the total for this first. I, I really want to open it to uh, questions with the hope that in the next round, I'm hoping to present the types of interventions that have to do with community and um, have to do with patients so that we could look at different dimensions of how you could do it. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's see if we can get some questions from people. And ideally, we would like to start a discussion, so I may be able to unmute several people and we can talk a little bit about what we just learned. Sure. Julia, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> will you please uh, say, the, say the question that you sent me to Dr. Alegria? Sure. I was just wondering, um, thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering why in the simulation uh, you thought Latinos did not show any significant benefit from employment uh, the way that whites, Asians, and blacks did. And if you had any um, predictions as to why. Yes, um, yes. It was uh, something that people were, uh, including myself, was quite shocked. Uh, we think it, it it is because a lot of Latinos do get employment, not necessarily through traditional ways, and also because we, we said two, two hypotheses in the paper. One has to do with in uh, the possibility that in Latino families, uh, employment is not the priority in the sense that people might, the family might share resources across the, the uh, people that have uh, that are suffering from mental health conditions. So the impact of getting a job might be reduced because there's always a buffer that is related to the family. And then the second thing is that it might be related to the types of employments that Latinos could get. So one of the things that I should say in this simulation um, that people have discussed about is that maybe the, the difference in the types of employments would not move them that far away because it might be, for example, uh, jobs that they had uh, that they could have uh, in, in sectors that are very low pay with very unstable types of uh, jobs. And that that might be the reason that the impact of jobs uh, didn't seem to convey as much uh, benefit were saying before, a lot of the people that we have in our studies are people also that are, uh, you know, on, on, on undocumented and some of them, you know, will not be able to get the jobs uh, from the type of jobs that we were talking about. So it would be interesting to do this study again, replicate it with a sample of people uh, to see why when we ask, basically people said it, it has to do with the family and it has to do with the types of jobs, but we're still struggling. What is your idea about why would it be? Um, the first thing that came to my mind was what you brought up um, about kind of the family component. If it's not as highly valued um, in a system that maybe it wouldn't have the same effects for, as for other um, ethnic groups, or if it was a resource related thing based on documentation status or like added level of disparity. Um, but thank you, that really helped. I have a, a comment here from Wendy Cook. Uh, they said, I was thinking the same thing where condition for that next may not, it's be as fair or adequate than other groups. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you, Wendy. So anyhow, I think this issue about, uh, like I was saying in education, I think we're having the same impact on employment, that you don't get the same benefits um, 
of necessarily some of these programs, although there's discussion of whether it really needs to be tailored to the Latino population to make effect. I wonder if language play a role too. Uh, maybe stress from that barrier during work in addition to less protection. Um, yes, I think language could be also. We didn't have enough of a sample uh, to really break the group by language, but we could do, this is exactly the type of analysis that people could do. And we're, we're happy to share uh, the program. So if people want to do simulations, I really recommend this is an area that National Institute of Mental Health is extremely, extremely interested in doing because it means that you don't, you know, the uh, you don't you're not costing as much as running this uh, studies. And at the same time, you can identify which are the best uh, programs or the best interventions using data from already collected. So, yes, thank you for that about language, too. You're, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I definitely think language, uh, because we've seen, you know, now language, the importance of language. And I'm going to, when I uh, present some of the data of the, I'm going to talk about this, the other studies in the other areas, the community, um, the patient provider um, and provider uh, studies. I'm going to talk about the importance of language because more and more we're finding language, being able to speak the language of the participant or the patient makes a huge difference, a huge difference. Uh, even more than what we're finding with ethnicity or race. Interestingly enough, what we're finding is language really uh, appears to trump everything.